Okay, well, let's start. So, dear students, faculty, and community members, welcome. Um, my name is Yelena Prokhorova. I'm the director of the Russian and Post-Soviet Studies program here at William & Mary. Um, before I introduce our distinguished guest, I would like to thank our sponsors. Um, this talk is part of the Tapper Speaker Series. Now it's ninth year running, and we, will, we are very grateful uh, open seat right to our sponsor, um, Gregory and Tapper. One over there, too. Support. We would also like to thank There's a couple of chairs uh, there, too. The Center for International Studies, uh, the Global Research Institute, right. and it's, the International okay. Justice Lab here at the college uh, for their support yeah. of this event. So, our speaker today is Colonel Eugene Hedman. Colonel Hedman is an expert in the law of armed conflict, military law, government ethics, and national security law. He currently serves as the U.S. Mission Deputy Director of the Military Analysis Cell in the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group in Kiev, Ukraine. He served previously as the deputy, and he has such a long list of, you know, just outstanding service, and you can ask him about any of it's that. It's boring, very boring, so <laughs> you can <No>. skip ahead. <laughs> so, uh, he served previously as the deputy legal advisor on the White House National Security Council, where his portfolio included NATO, the International Criminal Court, African Affairs, International Organizations, Emerging Technologies, International Humanitarian Law, Human Rights, and Ethics. He served in a variety of roles in the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General Corps, including Senior Policy Attorney Advisor for the Labor and Employment Division at the Pentagon, Senior Prosecutor for Fort Hood, and as, as, as an Operational Law Attorney for U.S. Forces Iraq. For 12 years, he served as an infantry officer, including an assignment as an airborne infantry platoon leader in the 82nd Airborne Division. Colonel Lindman is the author of multiple articles featured in foreign affairs and foreign policy magazines, Lawfare, and Just Security blog. He has had numerous appearances in national media and has many military awards and decorations. We are so lucky to have you. <laughs> today with us. Um, I encourage everybody to stay after the talk uh, for a Q&A session, and please help me welcome uh, Colonel Eugene Vindman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the mic is on. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, typically, if uh, we're at 10% of room capacity, I consider that a successful talk, so this uh, is much better. Um, I'm glad to be here today uh, because uh, William & Mary is a great school and also because my son Max uh, is a freshman here and so I'm glad to be able to contribute um, something to the dialogue here on campus. I'm going to uh, speak for about 30 minutes and then um, Alex and I will have maybe a, a, a Q&A uh, and then leave maybe 15-20 minutes or more. Uh, happy to stay longer for um, student questions. So um, I'm going to start off briefly and talk a little bit about my family uh, background because um, some people find that interesting. And um, my family emigrated from the Soviet Union um, in 1979. Uh, I, I was born in Kiev and left when I was just about four years old. Uh, we were in transit for six months, and it was my twin brother, uh, my dad, um, my older brother, and uh, grandmother. Um, my mom uh, was suffering from cancer, and uh, the reason why we left were actually several reasons we left. My dad, first of all, as they say, was a card-carrying member uh, of the Communist Party and had a pretty um, interesting and, and fairly senior position as an engineer. And if you think about you know, the communist system, um, you know, doctors and lawyers didn't mean much because they, they serviced individual uh, needs, but engineers helped build the, the bright communist future. So, and he was an uh, engineer of, of um, one of two districts in, in Kiev, which was the second largest city in the Soviet Union at the time. So pretty comfortable, but we're a Jewish family and um, anti-Semitism was, um, was rife throughout uh, the Soviet Union. Um, 
my, my dad was fed up with uh, the communist system, and uh, my mother was dying of cancer, and he was hoping there would be some treatment for it. She ended up dying before we left, um, and so it was uh, my dad, um, the three brothers, and uh, his mother-in-law. And uh, if you look in the upper uh, left, that's uh, my, my twin brother and I uh, in about 81 or 82, not long after we got here. And we'd like to think that we discovered Ken Burns. So uh, some of you may know Ken Burns. He's a famous documentarian. One of his earliest documentaries was on um, the Statue of Liberty. And he saw these two kind of wild immigrant kids running around uh, Coney Island. And he stopped to chat with us. And as twins do sometimes, we talked over each other or, or finished uh, each other's sentences. And um, it was about seven seconds, but uh, it, it made uh, Ken's career. So, um, uh, so when my family moved here in the 79, uh, December of 79, uh, my dad didn't speak any English. And uh, he hauled furniture for about 20 bucks a day uh, in New York City to support us. Uh, until he learned enough uh, uh, technical, uh, enough English, where he passed an engineering exam for the city of New York and ended up uh, working for the city for 20 years and um, uh, joined a union and, and um, dug the, the big water tunnels under the city uh, for, for quite some time. All right, so um, the next picture on the right is um, Alex pinning uh, my colonel's rank on me. Uh, uh, this was actually just last year, about a, a year and a half ago, um, in front of Lincoln Memorial. The one next to us, uh, uh, next to that one is uh, holding the two girls, is me and Alex. We have daughters about the same age. One of them is in the front row here, the redhead. She's hard to miss. Um, we're, we're holding each other's daughters, actually. Uh, the one to the right is also a fairly, um, not long after we arrived, and. Uh, sometimes people have fun trying to pick out which one's which. Uh, next on the left is Alex and I walking out of um, his testimony in front of um, Congress for the impeachment hearing. Um, and um, that was quite a spectacle. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen as many flash bulbs or, or uh, flashes as I saw that day. Um, and to the right is that same promotion. Uh, to the right of that is uh, my promotion or Alex's promotion to lieutenant colonel, I don't remember which one. And because service is kind of a family business, uh, the bottom left is my wife. She's a captain, uh, PhD molecular geneticist, but our Army uh, Reserve uh, microbiologist. So, okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the way the war unfolded on uh, February 24th. And, and if you ask the Ukrainians, uh, they'll tell you right away that they've been fighting this war since 2014. And that's true, because that's when uh, um, really the, the fighting started in Donbass and, and Crimea. And um, uh, the, the most urgent phase, of course, started in February of this year. and. Um, it was quite a, a steady buildup. Uh, the, the Russians had stationed uh, somewhere between 150 or 170 uh, thousand troops all around the country, and um, you know we we don't know for sure what the strategic objectives are, but we can we can surmise based on what happened, how the campaign rolled out, and, and frankly, a, a lot of smart analysts that you know they they intended to seize the entire country, um, control uh, the Black Sea all the way to Crimea to give them a land co corridor, destroy Ukraine's army, subjugate the population, and further divide NATO and the US. And I would say, out of all those strategic object objectives, um, they temporarily achieved one, which is uh, control of the Black Sea port, uh, or, or the, the Black Sea uh, and Azov Sea. And it's that spit of land, that the arrow um, leading to the east from Crimea. And ultimately, I think that they're, they're going to lose this war and they'll lose uh, all of this uh, uh, newly gained territory. But, um, you know, that, that remains an open question. As far as the other strategic objectives, um, frankly, NATO has never been more fully um, 
uh, supportive and um, coherent than it is in this conflict. Um, the, the, the Ukrainian uh, regime and, and Ukrainian, um, uh, I guess, the, uh, culture uh, is and society is stronger than it's been um, uh, at least in recent memory. Uh, the population and the military have uh, shown no signs that they'll they'll give up and even in, in um, uh, spite of uh, some pretty uh, horrific bombing and I'll talk about that a little bit more and um, uh, internally displaced um, anywhere from uh, about a third of the population. So one last thing I'll say is that when you start a campaign and the strategic objectives are, are completely misaligned and um, you, know, you, you think that you're gonna roll into a country and you're gonna be greeted as liberators that, the, uh, that you will uh, seize the country in, in, in 10 days and, and you make assumptions on that and that's how you structure your forces and build your logistics, it's, uh, I would say almost impossible, probably impossible to achieve operational and tactical objectives. And that's kind of how the campaign is, has uh, rolled out. So um, this is a partial map, but this shows that uh, of that area where the, the Russians attacked and they attacked from, from Belarusia and uh, from Russian territory, uh, the Ukrainians have liberated, frankly, all but 20% of the, the territory um, that was seized. So we're talking about tens of thousands of square miles. For context, the size of uh, Ukraine, it's about the size of Texas. So if anybody's been in Texas, it takes like, you know, eight, 10 or more hours to get across the state. Um, it's, quite, uh, it's quite a long drive and I've driven from the border all the way to Kharkiv, which is um, the, the upper right area in red. And um, it, it's, a, it's a very large, but also beautiful country. And this map is also, frankly, a little bit out of date because even some of that red territory uh, has been liberated. So the entire uh, um, um, Kharkiv Oblast has been liber liberated and um, uh, down south. So um, I talked a little bit about the size of, of the forces. If you look on the right side of the slide, uh, these are uh, the best estimates of what the, the Russians um, attacked with. So about 750 tanks, um, 45,000 combat troops, and about another 100, 100 plus thousand support troops. And if you think about how uh, campaigns kind of, um, anytime you have a campaign, uh, the uh, significant uh, portion of, of the personnel employed uh, in military forces are uh, support and logistics troops. So uh, frontline fighting forces, the, the artillery, the infantry, the armor, are usually a sm much smaller subset of that. And if they attacked with 45,000, uh, on the left side is the estimate of, lo uh, of losses. Now, this comes from the Kiev Independent, so um, it's, it's a Ukrainian source, but frankly, the Western sources are not that far off. Uh, the Russians are projected to have lost somewhere around 90,000. So um, that is, um, frankly, the, the U.S. has not seen casualties like that in, in its fighting in, in recent memory. Even... Um, the Vietnam War, which lasted uh, many more years, was about 50,000 dead. So we're we're nearing double that. So this is the this is the largest uh, uh, war in Europe since World War II, and frankly, it's the the biggest threat to uh, global peace and security and a rules-based international order since World War II as well. Some people can argue about whether it was the collapse of the Soviet Union that was, uh, you know, the biggest event. But I think um, there's a, a fair case to be made that uh, it's this this uh, very large land war. And um, you can also see that the amount of material destroyed is um, frankly enormous. So uh, the Russian forces um, as, as a land power are um, a, a shadow of what they were just um, 11 months ago. And um, even even uh, if you think back uh, on the attack on the Moskva, the, the flagship uh, in the Crimean, uh, there have been a number of really uh, powerful moments in this, in this war where the Ukrainians have um, won pretty significant um, uh, psychological victories. Okay. 
uh, I'll uh, mention actually one more thing about this. So, you know, without getting too too much into the weeds, um, in in the military, there are sort of doctrinal terms of suppress, neutralize, destroy. So, in order to suppress the force, which means um, you temporarily degrade a, a unit from uh, being able to function normally, you have to take out three percent of that unit. To neutralize it, uh, which means render the enemy personnel or material incapable of interfering with your tasks, that's te that's ten percent, and destroy it's thirty percent. So we're we're really uh, almost like an order of magnitude, or at least three times um, that level of destruction. And, and the Russians have um, gone ahead and, and mobilized uh, three hundred thousand additional troops, um, but they're up against a, a very determined, motivated Ukrainian force of about a million, including reserves, and um, they still, all their fundamental issues about how they train their leadership have not been fixed. So they uh, are basically putting their newly mobilized personnel into a meat grinder, and they're immediately going to the front. There are reports that they're going to the front, they're being annihilated, and um, uh, just fresh forces are being pushed behind them. So it's a terrible um, sort of human suffering um, story, but ultimately the Ukrainians are defending their homeland. They're defending their, their freedom, their way of life, and um, yeah. Okay, so there are a couple of different phases here, and for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through a, a great deal of detail, but if you think about phase one was the initial attack, and that, that, that was turned back. Phase two was um, the, um, the sort of stalemate in fighting over the, the course of the summer. And um, actually, there was an interesting report that came out from the Royal um, Institute, uh, Rusi is the name of it, but it talked about um, some early findings from the fighting. And one of them that, that struck me is that in, um, in March or April of this year, the Ukrainians started to run out of ammunition. So small arms, ammunition, artillery, and, and things like that. And that really affected their ability to fight. So a lot of the stalemates over the course of the summer were due to um, the Ukrainians not, just not having uh, the firepower they needed. So when the, if the, the um, Russians were shooting 40,000 rounds of artillery. The Ukrainians were shooting something like 10 uh, or, or, or 4 to 10. It, so sometimes a 10 to 1 overmatch. Um, phase 3 was the Ukrainian offensives in the north. So the, the massive offensive um, in Kharkiv that, that freed something like eight to 10,000 um, square kilometers uh, of, of territory, a lightning offensive. Uh, and the one in the south that was a lot more deliberate in Kherson, but uh, equally as impressive. And so, you know, <clears throat> sometimes you'll hear commentary, commentators talk about, well, you know, the, the Ukrainians, before we give them weapons, we need to make sure that they, they can demonstrate that they can fight a defensive battle effectively. And they did that in phase one and uh, successfully repelled the, the Russian attack. Then in, um, before they get additional offensive weapons, uh, some commentators will say they need to demonstrate they can fight offensive, which is much more complicated because you have to coordinate a lot more elements. You have to have a lot more material to support that. Um, and they did that successfully. And so um, now, um, you know, the, the, the question of what material to give them, how fast they learn, they're very smart, they're motivated, uh, and they're agile. So if, if um, you know, U.S. forces operate on a sort of a, 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 a mission command, like the commander says, hey, this is what I want done, figure out how to do it, the Russians will tell you, I, this is how I want you to do the attack. And if there's any deviation, it has to go up to like some high level commander. It's really problematic for them. Anyway, that was phase three. So phase four is where we're, we're sort of going into right now. And so it's pro about providing, uh, in order to allow the Ukrainians to achieve victory, it's about providing the right kinds of weapons uh, and logistical support. Um, um, planning for the Ukrainian transformation. For instance, they've expended uh, a lot of their Soviet era of material in uh, ammunition. And so they're transitioning now to Western NATO standard. Um, they're very concerned about war crimes, which is the, the next portion of uh, uh, um, my, my talk. Um, 
And of course, the, the ever-present uh, avoiding uh, WMDs. And frankly, this is an area where I think uh, there's probably not a great deal of risk. Um, even uh, Russia's closest allies, um, China has come out recently in the last few weeks and said that they, they would find uh, a nuclear escalation unacceptable. Um, and right now, if you think about um, the reason to use nuclear weapons would be if there's an existential threat to, to Russia. And um, all of this fighting is occurring in, in Ukraine. And there's a great map, I don't have it in here, but it, talk, it shows you sort of a satellite image at night of light emanating from like cities and things like that. And you have this dark swath north of the Black Sea, that's Ukraine. But right across the border, um, 20, 20 kilometers north of Kharkiv, um, is is a fairly small city and it's lit up. Belarus is lit up. Uh, Poland and, and um, Romania. Uh, so this fighting is really restricted to um, uh, Ukraine, and it's not likely to cross the border. So um, there would be very little rationale to uh, using nuclear weapons because it's not like the Ukrainians are going to attack Moscow. Um, now, that's different than whether it's an existential threat to Putin himself. Uh, if you think about it, Putin has um, styled himself as a strongman. And he's demonstrating right now he's not particularly strong. So his survivability is a different question about whether the country uh, or, or some regime in, in Russia will survive. Okay, so I'm going to um, cover this very briefly. Um, so there are a number of really fascinating legal issues, and I don't know if there are any lawyers or budding lawyers here. I know um, William Mary has got a, a decent law school. Um, so um, the first question, or first issue, and there are so many more than this, but a few that, that struck me as interesting is this just ad bellum. And, I try to keep the Latin uh, to a, a minimum in this talk, but just ad bellum is basically just war. Whether the war was started justly, was it self-defense? Uh, was it a war of necessity or was it an unlawful war of aggression? Just ad bellum is how you fight the war. So there are different uh, public international legal regimes that govern those things. Um, and the, the Russians are really fighting this war illegally from the start and in the conduct. And um, the UN was an organization that was developed in, in the wake of World War II in order to establish sort of a rules-based order uh, and uh, prevent uh, larger aggressive countries from attacking and destroying or subsuming smaller countries. And in that uh, system, there's a Security Council of five members. Russia is one of those members uh, right now. And so their job as a Security Council member is to uh, prevent aggressive wars or respond to aggressive wars. And, and actually, they're the principal um, uh, violator of that system right now. And um, so illegal in the, in the start, of course, because they're a P5 member, if there's a resolution or some action, they just veto it. So um, that's why the UN is, is really, uh, there's an existential threat, in my opinion, to the UN system and, and a rules-based system. Um, okay, so just some bellow is how you fight a war. And there are four basic principles here. It's military necessity, distinction, proportionality, and humanity. And um, generally speaking, what that means is you only attack military targets. You're prohibited from attacking civilians or civilian objects. Um, and that, um, and that's distinction. Proportionality is that if you're going to conduct an attack, you have to factor in um, the civilians and make sure that uh, it, the, the destruction that you're causing is not disproportionate to to the civilians. But war inherently is is a is a is a terrible endeavor. Uh, people die. So this is kind of how countries came together and, and over the course of centuries, but really culminating in the 20th century on um, how to, to manage war so it's at least not as terrible for civilians. Um, and that war comes from things like the Geneva Conventions, um, the Hague, um, and things like that. The last thing I'll mention on this slide is, is, is a little bit interesting, but um, so if you think about what the Security Council looked like in 1991, um, Russia was not a member of the Security Council. It was the Soviet Union. And one day it was the Soviet Union, and the next day 
it was Russia. And that happened because um, there's sort of a, a, a doctrine of successor uh, countries, but there's actually a, a, a system that the UN has developed on accepting new members. And Russia never went through that system. So um, I don't know how many of you recall, but on the first night of the war, the Ukrainian representative to the UN confronted the, um, the, the Russian representative. And it was, it, was, it was interesting because he said, what are you doing here? Why is Russia even in the room? And what he was, what he was referring to is Russia never was actually assessed. Um, the Ukraine, or Ukraine, not the Ukraine, Ukraine and the Belarus um, were members of the UN, but Russia itself was not. So um, whether they belong there or not um, is a good question. Probably not ripe to really discuss that right now because um, they still are, are significant land power and um, they have many nuclear weapons. But you know, when the time comes and uh, they're defeated and how they handle defeat, uh, whether they remain as a coherent country, uh, there may be a time where this question becomes a little bit more, more ripe. Okay, so my work there now, um, so I retired from the Army after 25 years in, in August, and um, I like being a retiree because I get to do only what I want to do. And um, actually, one of the things I want to do now is, is be useful and, and help um, uh, the Ukrainians. So um, back in May of this year, uh, Tony Blinken, Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State, announced this, this program called the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group. And it's a multinational program. The US, UK, and EU um, have come together um, because, frankly, as I mentioned before, the UN is not in a position to take any action. So this is a really um, uh, unique program where um, it's the, um, a, a coalition of the willing have come together um, to help the Ukrainians investigate and prosecute war crimes. And um, uh, I am uh, the director of, of the interagency uh, working group and the military analysis cell. And um, the job of this group is basically, and I'll show you kind of an eye chart here, but it's basically to help the Office of Prosecutor General, the, so the prosecutor of Ukraine, uh, investigate uh, war crimes of a, of a really uh, military nexus. So, um, you know, murder crime, murders and sexual violence cases, it not, not squarely in the purview here, but if it's uh, POW ab abuse or indiscriminate bombings or attacks on infrastructure, um, the command responsibility, uh, significant swaths uh, of the crimes, uh, uh, my group uh, investigates that. And they uh, collect, analyze, and process uh, this to help the prosecutors. And I, I've been pretty impressed, actually, with the Ukrainians' uh, abilities. So they're, they're uh, experienced prosecutors. They're smart. They're, they're um, well-educated. But uh, law of war, or international humanitarian law, is, is uh, considered lex specialis, which means it's a, a specialized area of the law that unless you practice in that area of the law, you don't really understand it. So if you're just a civilian uh, prosecutor, um, you may not understand what exactly constitutes a war crime. What is indiscriminate bombing? What is, uh, what is the violation of distinction pro, uh, principle or, or proportionality? And uh, my, my group um, brings in international experts to help the Ukrainians kind of parse these things out because ultimately accountability must meet international standards. And the Ukrainians have prosecuted a couple of cases that have um, been criticized and um, I think the international community has an interest in making sure that there's accountability, but it meets international standards. Um, the other thing they do is they have a very strong IT sector, so they have like data analytics and seismology and things like that, and they've put together charts that can you know show you uh, the, their frequency and, and um, uh, magnitude of bombings and things like that, and how how these um, have played out over the course of the campaign. Um, Okay, so this is the eye chart that I mentioned. Um, the inter interagency or inter institutional working group is in red here. And uh, you can see that all of the different elements, um, so by, by Ukrainian law, the prosecutor general has the job of, of um, prosecuting war crimes and investigating this. And so they have to bring 
all the inter interagency partners in the Ukrainian government together to investigate and prosecute these war crimes. So you have, thing, you have the Ministry of Defense, you have National Guard, National Police under the Ministry of Interior, you have security services, um, and um, you have all of these different elements, uh, intelligence that are feeding into this inter-institutional working group that is, um, the, the lead is a, a Ukrainian uh, three-star general, and uh, the deputy prosecutor general of Ukraine is, um, is the, the counterpart in the prosecutor's office. All right, and this is my last slide. And um, this is an older slide, but it kind of gives you a sense of the, the types of uh, war crimes that are predominant in, um, in Ukraine right now. So you have attacks on um, uh, civilians and civilian objects. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the law of war prohibits attacks on civilians and uh, civilian objects. Um, and that, that's true, um, but just like any law, there, there are exceptions to it. So um, if it's a defended uh, uh, location, if there are troops in the area, then a civilian object may become uh, uh, justified for attack. But there are plenty of areas where that is Absolutely not the case. For instance, uh, attacks on like maternity wards, schools, hospitals, um, these have happened quite frequently. And um, not the last time, but the time before, uh, when I visited Kharkiv, the second largest city where there was a great deal of fighting, there's a, 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 a complex part of the city. So the city has like one to two million, I think maybe around two million people. Pretty, pretty big city. Um, there's a complex that had these massive apartment blocks here. If you think about like Soviet style apartment blocks, you know, um, 20, 30 story, uh, or yeah, some, somewhere in that range, uh, uh, apartment buildings, um, you know, dozens and dozens of them. Uh, it housed 100,000 people. Um, that area was bombed for, for months, uh, including artillery, missiles, and actual, uh, um, uh, aerial bombardment, and uh, there's not a soul that lives in there. Not, I'm not saying that everybody was killed in that area. There are certainly lots of people that were killed, but it became uninhabitable because there's no power, no water, uh, and uh, people were just not going to stay where, where they would be subjected to bombing. So 100,000 people just in that one area were displaced. Um, I, I mentioned attacks on protected uh, personnel and facilities. And then um, another area uh, that uh, was an issue earlier in the war is, is uh, Russian troops dressing up either as Ukrainians or something like that, uh, trying to uh, um, fool uh, Ukrainians into believing that you know, they were friendlies and then attacking them. That's called perfidy. But there, there are many more, um, but I do want to get to questions, so maybe we can uh, do that now. That's actually a, a good question. So if they went into combat uh, without, so I, I spent some time as a uh, advisor to commanders. And so, you know, sometimes these questions come up in, in, in headquarters and um, we're supposed to provide advice on whether they can attack a target or not. But uh, going into combat without some sort of uh, distinctive uh, insignia or emblem, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a uniform, but if, uh, if you think about, if you've seen pictures, they have either yellow armbands or red armbands or, or white armbands. That is distinctive enough insignia that if they're wearing that, then uh, it would not be perfidy. Asking for 
higher grade weapons, more advanced weaponry, such as like the Abrams thing, class 16, the Griffin, uh, even like longer range missiles. What do you think is the probability of them actually getting it now, than in the past? Do you think it's probably going to be the or? Yeah so, the yeah, so the question is, uh, what is the probability, I'm going to paraphrase, of the Ukrainians getting uh, more advanced weapons um, uh, now that they've demonstrated the capability? Is that, okay. So um, the, the short answer is that uh, you know, one area where I would criticize uh, the administration, and I think the administration has done a number of things quite well. They've done a, a, a good job of bringing together a coalition for sanctions. Um, probably not as, mu uh, as much as is necessary. They've also put together a coalition um, uh, of, of NATO partners and Western partners to help support um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, but where they've been deficient, I think, is providing, uh, is, is that, first of all, they are responsive. So it takes some action or some sort of outrage on the part of the Russians before they, they start to funnel in um, um, additional weapons. So they, they seem to be always on the back foot. Um, you know, at, and I, I said this during a talk, but first, you know, they had a, the, the Ukrainians had to demonstrate the ability to conduct defense, then offense, and so on and so forth. Um, they've demonstrated all those things quite effectively. Um, and they can, they can um, handle more advanced weapon systems. Uh, air defense, a critical requirement in order to protect the population. It's not an offensive capability, uh, it's a defensive capability. Uh, they, can, they can master that, uh, I think, quite easily. The area where it starts to become complicated is that in order to have these advanced systems, especially aviation or tanks, uh, you need a logistics tail. And the Ukrainians have logistics that would support like Warsaw Pact old Soviet equipment. They don't have that for, um, for um, uh, NATO Western uh, type systems. But um, they've already received a bunch of um, uh, advanced multiple launch rocket systems, uh, advanced self-propelled artillery. Um, they're conducting repairs on that, probably not um, you know, to, to um, uh, a manufacturer standard, but they, can, they um, are capable of, of doing that logistics. So um, actually just today I saw um, uh, reports that the U.S. had agreed that they would um, train up to 2,500 Ukrainians in a, in a large training area in, in uh, Germany, and that there is um, talk about providing um, additional multiple launch rocket systems. I think it's probably a matter of time uh, before uh, they get more advanced weapon systems. I don't know that they'll quite get to um, you know, F-16s or A-10s or something like that, but um, short of that, I, I think they're probably going to get start to get uh, more advanced uh, weapon systems. Well, that is my hope, certainly. How does uh, the IWG um, intend to handle uh, militia groups on both uh, the Russian and Ukrainian side, kind of operating outside of, I guess I would say, you know, formal military jurisdiction, especially, I don't know, after the war, but currently during the war? Yeah, so that's a great question, because, you know, when, when you talk about um, maybe not militia groups, but maybe mercenary groups, like Wagner, for instance, um, I think, uh, you know, if they're, if they're mercenaries, then uh, what they, um, there's a concept called combatant immunity, which means that if you're two uniformed forces and you're both wearing uniform and they're, you're, you're in a war, if you see a bad guy from the other side, you can shoot. You don't have to say, you know, put up your hands or whatever. You, you can shoot them and you're, you're immune from being charged with murder. And um, that's, it's one of the rules of, of war. Uh, mercenaries don't enjoy combatant immunity, so they can be charged with murder. Uh, or, or, uh, and fr or frankly, um, it, there are a number of different criteria under the Geneva Conventions that lay out what, what it takes to be a member of the armed force or an auxiliary or something like that. And if you don't meet that test, then you, A, don't have combatant immunity, you can be charged with war crimes. Um, so I think uh, I would not be the least bit surprised with um, uh, uh, Wagner uh, uh, mercenaries being charged with crimes. And actually, 
also in, in the last uh, day or two, there's been discussion about uh, labeling them a, uh, a terrorist group. Could you explain for us what Wagner is? Yeah, so Wagner is, uh, is a, it's a mercenary group, basically. It operates sort of as an arm of the, the Russian military. They've been fighting in Syria. They've been fighting in, in uh, the Middle East and Africa. Um, and um, the, the CEO of this group or whatever, is, his nickname is Putin's chef, because um, I think he used to sell hot dogs or something like that. And, Oh, it's the, yes. yeah, schools. for schools, yeah. So a uh, school lunch ca or a school lunch guy. Um, anyway, um, uh, they they are operating basically as an arm of the uh, of the Russian forces. They recruit from prisons, um, and um, they're they're pretty. Um, their activities are pretty horrific. On the Ukrainian side, uh, it's interesting because there's something called the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. And that uh, organization actually has all the hallmarks of a, um, of a component of the armed forces. They, these are foreigners that have volunteered to join um, uh, the Ukrainian military, but they're paid the same amount as the, um, as the Ukrainians. They wear uniforms. They're trained on the law of war, which is a critical component to being considered a, a part of the military. So they, they meet that criteria. One area that's not particularly well uh, advertised but is, is frankly fascinating is that Ukrainians are defending their home territory, right? So there are actually groups of Ukrainians that uh, completely outside of the armed forces have gotten together and, you know, like put together a, a, a drone factory. And they'll go out to areas where they know that the Russians are, are fighting and they'll drop bombs on them. And so, um, you know, this is the, the, the status of these troops uh, is, or these people is quite interesting. Uh, in, in, uh, in the law of armed conflict, they would be considered direct participants in hostilities for the time that they're, they're taking that kind of action. Um, it starts to get a little bit complicated from there, but um, yeah, so there are just a number of interesting issues with, with kind of uh, auxiliary forces. I saw a hand up there as well. Um, maybe back there, all the way in back. Do you think it is appropriate um, or inappropriate to draw a comparison between um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the Russian invasion of Ukraine? And there's been a lot of comparison. Yeah, so actually, um, uh, the question is is there a uh, comparison that can be drawn between uh, the Russian invasion and the invasion uh, of Iraq? And um, I'm guessing you're talking about the second one, not the first one, right? Okay. Yeah, so look, that, that question has been uh, raised a couple times. And the reason, the, the example I talked about making strategic uh, 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 miscalculations is that um, I think that the U.S. Uh, thought that we would be greeted as, or at least some people uh, in, in senior leadership in the U.S. thought that we'd be greeted as liberators, and that was not the case. And that... Um, um, had an impact on uh, less troops going into the area to secure um, uh, the, the entirety of Iraq and how, how the campaign rolled out and the insurgency and such. So I think there could be some parallels that uh, are, are drawn as far as str strategic lessons about uh, making miscalculations. Um, you know, legally speaking, um, that's a, a complicated question. I would say um, from a, a, it's a complicated question. I think, you know, uh, comparing um, the, the Russian attack on uh, Ukraine, um, its, its brotherly neighbor, um, completely unwarranted, um, um, and frankly, peaceful democratic nation to, um, an attack on a cruel dictator uh, that has res was responsible for you know thousands or tens of thousands of deaths. Um, you know, it's somewhere on the continuum of of problematic, but I wouldn't say they're uh, um, equivalent. Yeah, yep. thank you. Um, my brother-in-law, he works for the DNI, and we were discussing back in the early months of the war uh, at dinner that. In like a pure numbers game in a war of attrition, he didn't think that the Ukrainians could achieve a total win in this scenario. 
because the numbers just didn't match up and you didn't see a, uh, a scenario where they would be able to regain all the territory they had lost, perhaps some concessions, but not all. So do you think there's any sort of legitimacy to that argument now in the status quo, or has Russia underperformed so significantly that numbers don't really matter anymore as much as they seem to in the long run? Yeah, so um, numbers always matter because quantity has its own quality. Uh, but um, having said that, the Russians have underperformed uh, pretty dramatically, and the Ukrainians have overperformed. And um, you know, right now there's so if you think about a country like Russia, it's got about 140 million people or so, to a country like Ukraine, about 40 million. So, you know, um, three and change uh, times the size. But um, the the population in Ukraine has basically been fully mobilized, and the population in Russia has not been fully mobilized, I mean, fractionally uh, at best. And, um, you know, th there are, are a number of great resources on social media, like Twitter, that actually go pretty fantastic analysts. And right now, the loss rate of the Russians is somewhere between three or four to one. And so I think if you look at that and you extrapolate, um, I think the Russians will probably uh, um, uh, be uh, attrited or um, uh, worn down faster than the Ukrainians at this point. So if, if the Russians have lost to 80,000 to 90,000, the Ukrainians maybe around 20,000 military. That's not including civilian casualties, which that number becomes much, much higher. So I think the short answer is I think the Ukrainians can win. Uh, they will win. Um, and I think that looks something like the, uh, the East being liberated, at least to the February 24th borders, but maybe the entirety of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. And maybe the question of Crimea being left up to the end, because I'm not sure I'd consider a red line. The Russians have put together a number of different red lines that the, re the Ukrainians have just blown away, like literally. Um, and um, um, some of it really depends on where the Ukrainians think they need to stop. So. Yeah, I just had a question following up on that about longevity. So looking at like the X article, like going back to USSR and then comparing that to how Putin's been acting, how do you see like, okay, they lose the war in the minutes that they've been kicked out of Ukraine. But then what? Is he gonna just sit back and be like, well lost that one, or how, how, what is the long-term effect on Russia going to be? Yeah. So, look, this is a very difficult uh, kind of crystal ball type question, and I think he's going to lose. Um, I think that he's, it's hard for me to imagine that he uh, stays in power. Exactly how that, that happens, whether it's some sort of palace coup, whether the population uh, rises up or, or whether the regions start to fragment or something like that. Really hard to, um, to, to um, see how that plays out right now. I think as the situation develops, there'll be more um, uh, um, analysis. But uh, what I don't see is that, you know, to the extent that, look, this is a dictatorship, so uh, I'm not the first person to make this point. Many people make this point. Putin can s wake up tomorrow and be like, okay, we're gonna end this thing now, I'm gonna preserve what I have. And he can go back to his population and be like, okay, we won. And he could have a propaganda campaign and say, look, we, we took this much territory or whatever, uh, or we achieved our objective and we denazified, whatever. He can, he can claim uh, success in whatever form he wants and he, he may be able to get away with it. I don't think he's gonna do that because I don't think he's that smart. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that's about as much prognostication as I can do. Um, gentleman in the blue shirt, right? Yeah. Um, so going off of that previous question, do you think that given Putin has a significant chance of losing his post or possibly, um, say, dying in a regime change, do you think that he has more incentive to use the bomb um, in this conflict in order to prevent that? Yeah, so, I mean, look, uh, Putin, by some accounts, is like the richest person on the planet with like $400 billion of stolen assets, whatever. And so he enjoys uh, being 
rich and powerful. He's got a, he's got a family. I think we we have to assume um, he's not he's not insane. Like some people may say he's erratic, and I I don't believe any claims that he's insane. I think he's just um, he's a, he's a dictator. He's insulated, and he's bought you know his his um, own BS, and so. Um, I, I don't think that um, he's suicidal and nuclear war is, is suicidal. And so um, this is the, the issue about um, the, whether it's an existential threat to Russia or to Putin himself. And if it's an existential threat to Russia, that's one thing. If it's an existential threat to Putin, then we're in a different area. And um, it's not like he has a button on his desk that he alone presses and the, the nukes start flying. There's a chain, many people involved, and people will start to make an assessment and say, okay, Putin's, Putin's done for, but I'm not gonna you know, have my entire family die in a nuclear holocaust. Um, so I think we have to just, I'm not saying this, um, you know, I, um, these these are kind of people have thought through these things quite thoroughly, and it's not. Um, um, I think it, it's you have to be rational, and reasonable, in making these assessments, and and you know the risk of a nuclear war is I think very 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 small compared to what. Um, compared to the destruction, what Russia is looking for is a rules based international order, rewriting the script. I think the risk of something like that and other countries like China observing what happens there and, and taking lessons for Taiwan are much more significant and dangerous than uh, the risk right now of, of nuclear war and, you know, folding to some sort of uh, nuclear threat. So I see uh, a number of different hands here. How about on this side? So it seems like one of the, one of the most problems Probable, if, if you were to be toppled, one of the most probable ways to do so would be to kind of go for the head and turn the oligarchs against him, against Putin. Um, do you think that's possible, and do you think we're headed towards that with the economic sanctions that we've imposed on Russia? Um, so this is not... Again, there's a lot of, of guessing involved here, and I, I don't want to spend a huge amount of time on it, but I think that the oligarchs are, are cowed, and to the extent that there are like grumbles from the oligarch, some oligarchs, um, they fell out of windows, and so that uh, became less of a problem. Um, so I don't know that, um, at least in the short term, like some sort of palace coup is likely. Frankly, I think uh, the, the Russian people are also been um, cowed as well. So, um, you know, I would be guessing if I were to talk about the, the parameters for how Putin would go down. Uh, but again, I, as, a, as a strong man who's demonstrated he's not very strong, I, I don't see him being able to, to stick around once, this, once he's defeated on the, on the battlefield. Okay. <clears throat> It's, you know, privilege right, in the front row. So my question is the following. Um, so do you think that there is any chance, um, I, I have no doubt that Russia will lose militarily, right? Is there is any chance that the Russian leadership uh, will be brought to The Hague in absentia or in person, because I'm just saying, uh, you know, that th there are these multiple declarations now coming from Russia that we do not recognize, you know, the authority of international bodies, period. Yeah, so um, again, I I've said this several times, but just in the last day or so, because news happens quite rapidly here, but just in the last day or so, uh, the European Council. Uh, announced um, that they're interested in in uh, creating a tribunal to try the crime of aggression, and so there are a number of ways to get at at uh, Putin and and uh, the senior leadership. One is if you can draw direct command responsibilities for war crimes, but there's a separate international uh, criminal act uh, um, called aggression, so uh, starting a violent war. And there's genocide, frankly, uh, and the criteria. 
um, in Ukraine likely re meet the definition for genocide. So um, we're not talking right now necessarily the millions of people that uh, were murdered in the Holocaust uh, in World War II. But if you think about what the purpose of genocide is, is to wipe out the, uh, 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 a group of people in part or in, or in whole, the Russian government, the Russian leadership has specifically stated that that is their goal. So, and they are killing people and they're, um, so I think it does meet the criteria for that. So um, the short answer is that I think there's, um, people have described this as sort of a web of accountability. There are a number of different uh, areas for, so the Ukrainians, for instance, um, um, prosecuting in Ukrainian local courts is one mechanism. The International Criminal Court is another mechanism where the, the more senior uh, people are likely to be tried. This international tribunal for the the crime of aggression could be another one. And and states have individual responsibilities as well. So every state, as a matter of, in the Geneva Convention, is required to adopt local laws that, that uh, prohibit um, um, war crimes. And so... Germany can and have it, you know, if they, they catch somebody that enters their border or, or you know, there are various scenarios, but they could potentially try uh, uh, war crimes in, in Germany or different parts of Europe. So there's a number of different levels of accountability. Some of, some of these trials have already taken place. I anticipate many more. Um, some of them in absentia. Uh, part of our, our um, atrocity crimes advisory group are international experts. So prosecutors from Croatia and, and Serbia, people that have um, experienced this in, in recent decades, and they're still trying cases. So decades later. Okay, I'm not keeping good track about who raised their hand first. So I don't know if you, how about this gentleman right here? Okay, so um, you'll have to forgive me because 25 years in the army, I've got a little bit of hearing loss. But I think you said you were asking about um, how the war has played out, and my thoughts on the tactical operational. So, look, the the uh, Russians uh, have done a terrible job because um, part of it is because of the strategic sort of um, uh, setting uh, operationally and, and tactically. They've lost um, 12 or, or 1,400 officers in this conflict in 10 months, which is enormous, like 15 or 16 generals. Um, just for context, the U.S. lost, I think, one general in 20 years in uh, Afghanistan. Um, and um, they're, they're doing a terrible job. Um, their equipment works, uh, the way it was designed to work. The way it's employed by um, their forces is um, very poor, very poorly trained. And so um, their, their small unit tactics are, are, are terrible as well. Um, so they've done a, a, a poor job operationally and, and tactically. Uh, to the extent that they've had some successes, it's by raining down artillery like you know, tens of thousands of rounds and, and just kind of annihilating an area and then moving uh, forward. But really that stopped um, after the, the Ukrainians got high Mars and they were able to attack logistics and, and, um, and, and command centers and things like that. So I think just brief, brief comment on that point. So next question. Thank you. Uh, so regarding the OPG, what about there was some uh, issues with them not yeah, so um, one area that kind of strikes, strikes me as uh, like Lex Specialis is understanding the uh, what constitutes a war crime, what does not, is um, they tried a um, um, POWs that were captured um, on firing. Um, basically rounds that were fired indiscriminately. So one of the things that, you know, the, the guy pulling the trigger or pulling the lanyard or whatever does not necessarily know where that, um, that round is landing. Did people die? Uh, civilians die on the, on the back end? Yes. But you have to establish that, um, you know, there was an element of knowledge that uh, uh, they were 
they were taking orders if it was at somebody in the command structure. And so some of that kind of like more intricate knowledge of, of law of war um, is, is problematic. If you think about it this way, so if you try a crime of aggression, anybody that dies, anybody that is injured, anything that's destroyed is an incident, is, is an individual um, violation uh, of, of the war, uh, of the law, because that, that gets to the question of whether the law was lawful in the first place. But when you're trying war crimes, that's a little bit of a more specific area. Um, war is inherently... Um, it's, a, it's a terrible thing. People die. But not every death in the war, um, soldier deaths, even some civilian deaths, if they're kind of sort of collateral and all the appropriate me measures were taken, um, could ne that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that that was a war crime. Okay, so this will be the last question. I was hoping to ask if you could elaborate a little more on how uh, the onset of winter will affect the battlefield conditions for both sides. Sure. And um, if anybody, I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards, so I'm happy to, to chat individually. So, um, you know, some commentators have said, you know, like uh, winter will slow things down. Um, actually, I think it was the chairman and joint chief of staff that said that. And I um, tend to disagree because this is not like the um, the 19th century. Um, so uh, the reason why is this, is that, um, first of all, um, the Ukrainians and the Russians have had experience fighting in, in that um, environment for a long time. And so uh, their equipment, their personnel have, have some of this knowledge. Um, on the Russian end, I think that they're gonna suffer terribly and um, the casualty is probably gonna skyrocket for a couple of reasons. I think they're lacking winter equipment and uh, they're, they're poorly led, poorly uh, motivated. The Ukrainians have, um, have winter gear is my understanding. Um, they're better led um, and they're gonna take advantage of, of their environment and I think they're gonna be um, at least a few shaping offensives during the winter. So. All right, well, let's thank Colonel Winter for <laughs> And uh, I mean, there is a generous offer to just, you know, come and ask a question or comment personally for another 10 minutes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.